This video is brought to you by my kind Patreon supporters and channel members. If you enjoy my content and seek to take your support a step further, you can freely join my Patreon or become a channel member with several added benefits. With that out of the way, enjoy today's content. When the First World War was concluded and the Treaty of Versailles was drafted, there was a curious little article in the treaty specifically regarding Wilhelm II. Article 227 of the Treaty of Versailles states the following, quote, The Allied and Associated Powers will publicly arraign Wilhelm II of Hohenzollern, formerly German Emperor, for a supreme offense against international morality and the sanctity of treaties. A special tribunal will be constituted to try the accused, thereby assuring him the guarantees essential to the right of defense. It will be composed of five judges, one appointed by each of the following powers, namely the United States of America, Great Britain, France, Italy, and Japan. In its decision, the tribunal will be guided by the highest modus of international policy, with a view to vindicating the solemn obligations of international undertakings and the validity of international morality. It will be its duty to fix the punishment which which it considers should be imposed. The Allied and Associated Powers will address a request to the government of the Netherlands for the surrender to them of the ex-emperor in order that he may be put on trial." End quote. So, the Entente Powers were accusing Wilhelm of being a war criminal, that he had engaged in quote-unquote international immorality. And it didn't just stop there, his cousin, George V of the United Kingdom, said that he saw his cousin as the greatest criminal in history, and his Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, wanted Wilhelm to be hanged. And considering all the propaganda during the war depicting Wilhelm as a bloodthirsty creature, people blatantly started believing these ludicrous accusations against the Kaiser. In the end, the Dutch government refused to hand over Wilhelm after his exile, and for the rest of his life, the Kaiser would spend his time in the Netherlands, getting married in 1922 with his second wife. But his life in exile was far from easy. With the war now being over, he had to listen about how the international community saw him as a war criminal evading punishment, and back home in Germany, the people and the government wanted nothing to do with him. But let us ask the questions. Is Wilhelm truly an international war criminal? Was he really a villain who enjoyed watching people suffer and the Entente just wanted to bring him to justice? Or was this all just a charade, aiming to get the Kaiser out of the picture once and for all, and create a scapegoat that would blame the entire war on him and his country? Since the conclusion of the Franco-Prussian War, the German Chiefs of Staff had anticipated that eventually, the French would seek to reclaim the territories of Alsace-Lorraine, and with the formation of the Triple Entente, that threat was magnified by the possibility of Germany being encircled and attacked on two fronts. And considering the fact that since 1871, the French had heavily fortified the towns along the Franco-German border, a swift and direct advance into France was virtually impossible. For that reason, in 1905, Alfred von Schlieffen came up with a defensive plan, which his successor, Helmut von Moltke, expanded upon. According to Moltke, due to the vastness of Russia, it would take up to six weeks for them to fully mobilize, which would give the Germans time to crush France before turning their attentions to the east, and Moltke planned a swift route through Belgium and secure Paris within 40 days. From the start, Wilhelm was opposed to the invasion of Belgium due to the Treaty of London that guaranteed Belgian neutrality. But despite his opposition, his chief of staff went through with it. It's important to remember that the German Empire did not instantly choose military intervention. Rather, they sent a request to the Belgian King Albert. In the request, Belgium would give permission for German troops to pass through the country on the promise that they would pay in cash for all their provisions and an indemnity for any damage they caused. King Albert denied this request, warning that if this refusal was not accepted, the Belgian government was firmly resolved to repel, by all the means in their power, every attack upon their rights. But the interesting thing is, Despite King Albert claiming and wanting to defend Belgium's right on being neutral, 
Several days before the request was even sent, a large number of French aeroplanes came flying to Germany across the neutral territory of Belgium, without a word of warning from the Belgian government. And this was even confirmed by the British ambassador in Berlin, as he reported, quote, The French had already commenced hostilities by dropping bombs from an airship in the vicinity of Nuremberg, end quote. So there were already, reasonably, rumors circulating that Belgium was secretly siding with the Entente, despite the Treaty of London. Still, the Kaiser strongly objected to an invasion of Belgium because he did not want Germany to break her word, and because he knew it would bring Britain into the war. Soon enough, after the request was denied, German soldiers started marching into Belgium and enacting the Schlieffen Plan, and this ultimately led to Britain declaring war on the German Empire. No one was as devastated as Wilhelm when he heard that Britain had declared war, as Princess Evelyn Blücher wrote, quote, His shock and surprise were genuine when he realized what England was doing. He had not thought it possible. His friend standing near him, he said, The thing that Nicholas and Georgie should have played me false. If my grandmother had been alive, she never would have allowed it. End quote. Now, what did the princess mean when she said when he realized what England was doing? Well, despite George V repeatedly emphasizing his desire for peace, in 2014, a personal letter was made public, aimed at his foreign secretary Edward Grey. In the letter, George tells him that Britain must participate in the war to prevent Germany from becoming the most dominant force in Europe. When Grey observed that there was no justifiable reason for Britain to do so, the king told him that he must find one. Grey was very keen to ensure that Germany should take the blame for the conflict, telling the French ambassador to Russia, quote, The German government must be saddled with all the responsibility and all the initiative. English opinion will accept the idea of intervening in the war only if Germany is indubitably the aggressor. Please, talk to Sazonov to that effect." End quote. The Germans in general, and Wilhelm in particular, were desperate for an assurance of British neutrality, and several approaches had been made to Grey to ascertain his position and to discover under what conditions would Britain join the conflict. Grey was then asked, would the British remain neutral if Belgium was not attacked? And Grey would state, quote, Belgium might be an important, but not a decisive factor." End quote. So, three days after stating that the invasion would not be a decisive factor, Britain went to war in defense of Little Belgium. This was an obvious scheme by the King and Edward Grey to deliberately involve Britain in the conflict, not because they were generally concerned for Belgian neutrality. Ironically, James Ramsay MacDonald, the former Prime Minister also took note that this whole ordeal was a scapegoat for Britain to join, as he would state openly in the House of Commons, quote, Sir Edward Grey declined to discuss the matter. This act was suppressed by Mr. Asquith and Sir Edward Grey in their speeches to Parliament. When Sir Edward Grey failed to secure peace between Germany and Russia, he worked deliberately to involve us in the war, using Belgium as his chief excuse." End quote. And it is ironic that Britain would talk justly and mighty about defending a nation's right to neutrality. During the Boers' War, British troops marched through neutral Portuguese territory, and then later on during the Great War, bombarded neutral Greece to force them to join the Entente. Wilhelm was rightfully infuriated with all this hypocrisy, as he would state, quote, The way they have treated my poor sister, the Queen of Greece, is a shame and disgrace. They talk of our invasion of Belgium, but their acts in Greece are infinitely worse. The English try to cover all their acts with religion and talk of the benefits to civilization and humanity. But, hypocrites that they are, they continue to grab all they can get their hands on just the same. It is alright for the Allies to do these things, but when Germany does them, England rises up in righteous indignation." End quote. To Wilhelm, it seemed blatantly obvious that Britain had never intended to remain neutral, but rather had been preparing for war for some time now. 
it discovered that in April 1914, as Germany continued to export gold and grain, British banks began to accumulate vast reserves of gold as though preparing for a conflict. Even more, it was alleged that during a cabinet meeting on the same day before the question of Belgium had even been raised, Sir Edward Grey threatened to resign if Britain remained neutral. When the war had begun, Wilhelm was stripped of the Order of the Garter, which his grandmother had given him, and his crest had been removed from St. George's Chapel in Windsor, and the British public, who had once welcomed and praised him, now largely despised him. This was all thanks to the efforts of the British Propaganda Bureau, established in September 1914. So secretive was the Bureau, that even many members of Parliament were unaware of its existence, but from its office, it worked tirelessly to create an entirely false impression of the Kaiser. Posters portrayed him as a vicious monster devouring the world, while encouraging his bestial troops to slaughter innocent women and children. These caricatures were so upsetting to Wilhelm that he purposefully shortened his mustache in order to distance himself from them, as one German emigre who had often met him stated, quote, I wish I could make people see Wilhelm II not as that vulgar, brutal caricature with which life has poisoned the imagination, but as he really appears, man to man. The absurd caricature has done much to create that widespread feeling against the leader of the fatherland. How much better everybody would understand the man if all had heard his hearty laugh and had looked into those wonderful eyes." End quote. Supported by the British Propaganda Bureau, Countless books and pamphlets were published, criticizing, distorting, and mocking virtually every aspect of the Kaiser's life and personality. His artistic, musical, military, and literary talents were mercilessly ridiculed. Let me give you all an example of the absurd propaganda and distortion. His religious beliefs were used to portray him as a deluded warlord. It had been reported that he once told a pastor how he often studied the Bible, which he kept on his bedside table, how he loved reading it every night and finding the most beautiful thoughts expressed in it. But one British author suddenly turned this image of a devout and religious emperor into that of a ferocious megalomaniac by pointing out, quote, He read the Lutheran version of the Bible, which was unlike that of our own glorious English Bible, which was translated by peaceful scholars. His was the work of a fighter, and the grandest renderings of the original warlike books of the Old Testament." End quote. And Parliament was no exception to this hate-mongering. During a session, Admiral Charles Beresford shouted, quote, The head of the assassin, Wilhelm the Kaiser, should be hung from the highest tree in Potsdam as just retribution for cold-blood murders." End quote. Soon enough, many prominent British writers started joining in on this defamation campaign, and due to the strict censorship laws the Bureau had, any article that didn't portray the Germans as sadistic barbarians acting on the whims of a tyrannical Kaiser were not printed. It paid journalists, therefore, to write only the stories which the government wanted people to read, and when actual atrocities did take place during the war, they were ready to ensure that every detail was described and exaggerated to extremes. Let's take the case of Edith Cowell as an example. A nurse who had taken charge of a Red Cross hospital in Brussels, where she tended to injured soldiers from all sides. But, she had been secretly helping Anton soldiers and spies to escape to England. Eventually, she was found out and arrested, as more evidence started piling up against her, and she was eventually sentenced to execution by firing squad. When the news reached of her arrest, there was a massive outcry in Britain as they demanded her release, but the German authorities in Belgium insisted that she must stand trial on the charges of conducting soldiers to the enemy and helping hostile powers. But when Wilhelm heard the news of her arrest, using his mercy, he ordered her immediate release, stating that no woman could be shot without his express permission. Unfortunately, his message arrived in Brussels half an hour too late to save Miss Cavell, who was executed. 
The Kaiser's attempts to intervene were barely mentioned when the British and French press seized on the execution to further promote the idea that the Germans were merciless butchers led by a brutal emperor with an insatiable lust for power. As the Illustrated London News reported, quote, The thing was not done to protect the Prussian power. It was done to satisfy a Prussian appetite. The mad disproportion between the possible need of restraining their enemy and the frantic needlessness of killing her is simply the measure of the distance by which the distorted Prussian psychology has departed from the moral instincts of mankind." End quote. Several British figures sought to expose the injustice of the anti-German propaganda and recognized that its chief purpose was to inflame hatred. Once more, former Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald would write, quote, to use these things, which are inseparably connected with war, and which have been reported of every army operating in the field, as a means of stirring up hatred and prolonging the conflict, is devilish and must be condemned by every right-thinking man." End quote. Unrestricted submarine warfare is an important topic when discussing the First World War where German submarines were allowed to sink Allied ships without any warning, and that it was approved by Wilhelm. All of this is, in fact, true, but I would like to provide some context as to why this type of warfare was approved, and what was happening while it was active. Two months after the British established a naval blockade with the aim of starving out Germany, the German admirals saw no other choice but to retaliate by using their U-boats to sink supply ships carrying goods to Britain. U-boat captains were ordered to stop and search British merchant vessels, and after giving due warning to enable crews to escape on lifeboats, the ships would be sunk with torpedoes. As one American commentator wrote, quote, The submarines not only gave time to lower boats, but frequently took them in tow and brought them to safety. When the German auxiliary cruisers took aboard the crews and passengers of vessels, they treated them with kindness and humanity. This is proof against the theory of barbarity and cruelty attaching itself to her maritime warfare." End quote. But the British admirals, clearly annoyed that their supply ships were getting sunk, started playing dirty. Orders were given out that the crews were not permitted to abandon their vessels, but rather should ram the submarines, or, since much of the merchant fleet had been secretly armed, should open fire upon them. This policy made it impossible for the U-boat commanders to continue to assist the enemy crews without risking the lives of their own men, leaving them no alternative but to sink without warning any British ship they encountered. Not only that, but Winston Churchill started giving out more illegal orders, that merchant marines should paint over the names of their vessels and fly the flags of neutral countries to avoid torpedo attacks. Additionally, he manned some of the merchant fleet with Royal Navy officers, disguised as foreign fishermen or civilian sailors, so that whenever a submarine surfaced, the seemingly innocent trading boat was instantly transformed into a lethal warship. Because of this deceit and the British not abiding by the rules and using illegal tactics, Wilhelm's hand was forced in signing the order for unrestricted submarine warfare, which he at first was not so keen on signing. This meant that vessels sailing in British waters were to be deemed a legitimate target for the U-boat commanders. This order drastically worsened relations with the United States, because now their trading capabilities with the United Kingdom were severely worsened, and President Woodrow Wilson said that Germany was to be responsible for every American life lost, when ironically, he never addressed the German starvation blockade and said that it was not our business. Because the United States government seemingly did nothing to warn the American people of the U-boats, the German ambassador in Washington arranged for a notice to be printed in over 50 American newspapers, which read, quote, Travelers intending to embark on the Atlantic voyage are reminded that a state of war exists between Germany and her allies and Great Britain and her allies. The zone of war includes the waters adjacent to the British Isles, in accordance with formal notice given by the Imperial German government. 
Vessels flying the flag of Great Britain or any of her allies are liable to destruction in those waters, and that travelers sailing in the war zone on the ships of Great Britain or her allies do so at their own risk." End quote. Around this time, the luxurious British ship Lusitania prepared to depart from New York to Liverpool, a voyage which necessarily involved passing directly through U-boat patrolled waters. When the ship set sail, there were around 3,000 people on board, but few of the people knew that this ship could easily be converted into a gunboat in time of war, or the fact that this particular ship was loaded up with ammunition and explosives. It was also very convenient that the ship that was tasked with escorting the Lusitania received orders to not leave port, leaving the ship completely vulnerable. Additionally, the captain had also, conveniently, received orders to reduce his speed rather than to adopt the usual practice of moving quickly to outrace the submarine, and he did not engage in the typical zigzag maneuvers. In the early afternoon of May 7th, a German U-boat spotted the ship. Now the captain, convinced that the number of lifeboats, the proximity to shore, and the time it would take for the liner to sink, would allow the passengers to escape to safety, so he gave the order to fire at the ship. But then suddenly, there was a second explosion. Unlike the Titanic that sank in two hours, the Lusitania sank in 18 minutes because the torpedo set off all the other explosives the ship was carrying. As soon as word of the disaster reached Queenstown, a Royal Navy vessel was dispatched to rescue survivors, but again, conveniently, it was suddenly recalled without completing its mission. Almost 2,000 people lost their lives in the sinking, 120 of whom were American citizens. Around four months ago, Colonel Edward House, a friend and advisor to President Woodrow Wilson, sailed the Lusitania and reached Britain, meeting with Edward Grey and later on King George V. While talking with them, House mentioned that if a passenger ship was sunk, the wave of indignation that would sweep America would almost certainly bring the country into the war, and then the King muttered, quote, Suppose they should sink the Lusitania with American passengers on board. End quote. The recalling of the escort, the failure of the British or American government to warn of the dangers, and the words of the king all point to the fact that the Lusitania had been deliberately placed in harm's way to rouse the American people to support entry into the war. Nevertheless, after Woodrow Wilson continued criticizing German policy, the German Empire officially abandoned unrestricted submarine warfare and continued with their stop and search policy. But the British continued with their illegal tactics, conveniently not getting any criticism from Wilson. But one day, it reached a new level. A German U-boat stopped and started searching the steamer Nicosian. Considering the steamer was carrying ammunition to France, the captain ordered the crew to evacuate so they could sink the ship. But then, an American cruiser called the Barralong approached, stating that they would take the sailors to safety. When the ship was close enough, the American flag suddenly dropped as the standard of the Royal Navy was raised. The submarine came under intense fire as the German crew fell into the water. Instead of aiding the drowning men, the British sailors instead started shooting at them. When the German captain reached the Barralong, quote, the English seamen on board the Nicosian immediately fired on him, although in a manner visible to all. He raised his hands as a sign that he wished to surrender, and continued to fire after a shot had struck him in the mouth. Eventually, he was killed by a shot in the neck." End quote. This war crime outraged the German government, demanding the men to be tried, but the British refused, stating that such an event never took place. The Kaiser was once again urged to continue unrestricted submarine warfare, but this time he was not budging. After the Lusitania, he did not want more women and children dying. As a German critic stated, quote, The Kaiser's most glaring fault is that of trying to fight Great Britain with one foot in the grave of chivalry. End quote.
As the months went by, the German chief of staff was growing more restless, more eager for victory at all cost. But there was one man hindering that success, the Kaiser. Wilhelm kept personally intervening on behalf of civilians, prisoners of war, and even other soldiers. So in 1916, Germany became a military dictatorship, with the Kaiser now being a mere figurehead. Until 1918, the Kaiser started getting ridiculed by his generals, primarily when his eyes filled with tears on witnessing the extent of the suffering at Verdun, and getting physically ill for a week, they began accusing him of weakness. One time, an English woman wrote to the Kaiser, asking for help in finding her nephews who had been reported missing in action. As his chief of staff laughed at him, Princess Evelyn Blusher wrote, quote, A peal of scornful laughter rose from the other guests at the table. A German Kaiser, they said, had work to do other than search for missing English officers. The Kaiser remained silent, but on rising from the table, asked Prince Munster to try and get some news for the lady." End quote. Wilhelm well understood the anguish of parents whose sons had been wounded or killed in battle. He constantly worried for the safety of his five sons, who were all serving in some way. Rather than hardening him, Wilhelm's anxieties made him more empathetic to the concerns of other parents, but the greater his compassion, the more his generals tried to sideline him from operations and information. As Blusher again wrote, quote, He was kept practically under supervision by men like Falkenhayn, who never allows anyone to speak to him alone. They are afraid of the Kaiser's kind heart. End quote. Erich von Ludendorff, the de facto general chief of staff, was not prepared to accept the Kaiser's original war aims. He developed plans to annex Belgium, parts of northern France and Poland, while keeping Wilhelm largely in the dark about his schemes to which he was certainly opposed to. Unable to restrain his generals, the Kaiser was forced to retire into the shadows while they took over the government of the country as well as deciding the course of the war. But he did not want to just give up, as he started looking for a way to stop the slaughter. Wilhelm sought to bring about the status quo as he started drawing up a peace offer. As he told Bethmann, quote, What is wanted is a moral deed to the free world, from the pressure which weighs on all. For such a deed, it is necessary to find a ruler who has a conscience, who feels that he is responsible to God, who has a heart for his own people and those of his enemies, who possesses the will to free the world from its sufferings. I have the courage. Trusting God, I will dare take this step." End quote. Afterwards, Bethmann summoned the Reichstag as Wilhelm's peace offer was revealed. In the offer, Wilhelm once again called for a status quo, restoring the borders before the war. Belgium would once again be fully independent and Germany would pay reparations to the Belgian government. Although numerous generals insisted on inflating the demands and filling the offer with arrogant assertions, Wilhelm was willing to negotiate terms. As Wilhelm would write to the Pope, quote, Although Germany had the resources and ability to continue fighting to victory, to avoid further bloodshed and make an end to the atrocities of war, the Central Powers proposed to enter forthwith into peace negotiations. End quote. Without even having seen the proposal, the French Prime Minister instantly dismissed the peace negotiations, while the British also denied any negotiations until Germany was completely beaten. Rather than agreeing to the negotiations, the Entente powers refused to cease hostilities until Germany behaved like a conquered nation, and with this, Wilhelm's plans for peace crumbled. So, as we have seen, does Wilhelm really deserve to be called an international war criminal and warmonger? Absolutely not. The United Kingdom tried extremely hard to paint the Kaiser as a bloodthirsty beast in order to rally the British people against Germany, filling their minds with claims that Germans were savage beasts that bayoneted babies and violated women in Belgium. And because of this lie, this propaganda, Tens of thousands of young British men enlisted to combat this great evil, which never existed in the first place, and subsequently lost their lives. 
so it was obvious that the Entente powers wanted to put Wilhelm on trial after the Great War, not because the Kaiser was genuinely a war criminal who needed to face justice, but rather more as a propaganda move, and the people obviously wanted the blood after all the propaganda that was spread about him. If you watched my previous part on the Peace Kaiser, you would know that the United Kingdom was deeply worried about Germany's economic dominance over the world, and how they were about to dethrone them as the workshop of the world. This is not something the British took lightly, so they sought to break German hegemony by any means possible, even if it included lies. This was the reason why Britain was so willing and actively sought to enter the war, because they saw it as their golden opportunity to finally crush German power and influence in Europe, and this is the reason why the British did not want to accept Wilhelm's status quo peace offer, they would take nothing more than a broken and conquered Germany. In the aftermath, the Entente powers won the war, with Wilhelm fleeing to exile in the Netherlands. Germany was forced to sign the Treaty of Versailles, whose purpose was to make sure Germany could never challenge British economic dominance over the world again. And to this very day, these lies spread by the British that Wilhelm was a warlord who wanted to conquer everything are prevalent all around the world, and it is even considered a common fact. And it is personally outrageous to me that a man who tried everything in his power to preserve peace cared about his soldiers and people, was ridiculed and demonized in such a way that he is seen as nothing more than a villain in history.